welcome back and uh, let us resume our discussion on sampling. So, last uh, module we discussed the uh, leakage issue with the switch and we looked into the uh, R off and C s combination which is ultimately going to determine the size of the C s, what is the minimum value of the C s required uh, to successfully store the uh, sample data over the entire duration. Um, likewise, we also would like to make sure that the R on uh, and C s factor is also uh, matching our uh, criteria of being uh, less than the T on duration over here and that will ultimately determine what should be my T on, how aggressively my uh, T on can be scaled down, so that I can use very narrow pulses for uh, sampling my analog data. For that once again I can just uh, check the numbers, if I use minimum size transistor and assume the R on to be 10 k and uh, the C is uh, say close to 1 picofarad, then uh, once again the value that I get over here is going to be 10 power of minus uh, 6. So, you are having say capacitor of 10 to the power of minus 12 and you are having a um, T s which is say duty cycle of the T s you are trying to reduce by um, say uh, 1 upon 10. So, in that case you are going to have 0 0.05 uh, millisecond. Now, uh, whether we can go for 1 upon 10 or lower that of course, depend upon uh, uh, this particular value and uh, if you look at the sorry if you look at the uh, RC combination, you are having the overall R on given return to the power of 4 and this is going to determine my T on uh, duration. Here I am getting uh, overall factor of 10 to the power of uh, minus 8, which looks like much uh, smaller than the T on duration that we are targeting. Uh, our sampling duration is 0.5 millisecond and as compared to uh, the uh, R, C, R on C combination that we are getting that T on duration looks like pretty uh, large as a result we do have a lot of room for scaling down T on in this case. And uh, in general for CMOS technology even if you are using minimum size transistor uh, the sampling duration can be relatively uh, uh, small for uh, the given capacitor size that we have chosen. As a result uh, we can aggressively scale down this T on duty cycle ratio of maybe just 10 or even uh, lower can be uh, good enough for sampling the data. So, we do have enough uh, room for sampling or uh, reducing the duty factor and sampling the data with very narrow uh, pulses. Only thing that we have to make sure is that uh, the data is stable enough for that we have already determined the C s. So, what we conclude out of this is that for a minimum size transistor we have uh, uh, enough headroom for uh, reducing this T on and uh, uh, we can go down at least uh, by an order of magnitude and uh, use say a few microsecond of pulse width to do the sampling. So, even if I use 1 microsecond rather than 1 millisecond uh, we will still be within limit very comfortably within the limit. So, uh, let us go for you know 1 microsecond why we are not going for lower than 1 microsecond uh, that has something to do with the uh, generation of this 1 microsecond pulse. So, we will see that when we go for the digital control and all um, how these uh, control signals for sampling, uh, switching etcetera will be generated. So, uh, ideally speaking we can go down further maybe uh, uh, sub micro uh, second regime, but for the time being let us choose this 1 microsecond because it is significantly small as compared to our overall sampling duration of uh, 0.5 millisecond. So, if this is close to 1 microsecond it is hardly uh, uh, significant as compared to the entire sampling period. So, let us stop here. <coughs> just a few points regarding the R on if you are trying to increase the uh, switch widths just to uh, speed up the transistors there can be other issues that can also come into picture which relate to the uh, which are related to the non ideal effects of these switches and uh, uh, their effects can still be seen even if the switch is minimum size their effects can still be seen at the output and uh, uh, if I using if I using minimum size transistor those effects will be smaller, if we go on increasing the size of the transistor then they become a lot more uh, prominent. Um, that is another reason for choosing a sufficiently large C s. Let us see those two reasons those two uh, contributors very briefly and how they can have an impact on the sample data, how they can uh, uh, corrupt the sample data. Remember the uh, uh, the uh, resolution that we are seeking is around 15 millivolts, so we do not want this signal to be corrupted by more than maybe few millivolts uh, if we want to preserve the signal integrity over here. Therefore, any uh, 
uh, non idility is coming from the switches if it is trying to corrupt this data beyond few millivolts definitely it needs to be considered even if it is minimum size uh, uh, transistor we must make sure that it is uh, the non idility associated with this switch is not significantly distorting the uh, data over here so let us look into the two main factors which are which can distort the data which is uh, first one is the charge injection and we will look at the second one which is clock feed through. So, these concepts are in general very crucial when we are looking for switched capacitor circuits wherever we are having um, uh, amplifiers combined with lot of switches and capacitors to implement interesting functionalities like integrators, uh, closed loop amplifiers, filters and so on. Here we are just talking about the sampling operation where also these two uh, effects play a very important role and can limit the accuracy that we can achieve by the sampling process. <coughs> Inherently we will see that the transmission gate topology that we are using is uh, uh, going to give us advantage in terms of both of these, but it is important to be aware of both these uh, uh, non agilities. So, charge injection arises because of uh, turning off of the transistor whether it is NMOS or PMOS and if I look at this behavior you have a sampling switch suppose I am considering only NMOS and uh, the switch is turning on and then going off. Uh, we know that the channel charge in the NMOS if it is in triode region it will be almost uniformly distributed in the channel source drain are almost equivalent for the triode region when the input is almost equal to the output and under that condition I can write down the total channel charge in this MOSFET uh, Q C H as W times L times C O X times the overdrive voltage uh, which is going to be V G S minus V T. So, if I say V G which is uh, the gate voltage when the switch is on which is V D D uh, V D D minus uh, V S the source can be taken as either this one or this one, whether in triode region both the terminals are almost equivalent when the switch is on and therefore, I can just take it as V in minus the threshold voltage which is V T n. So, this is the overall channel charge that I can write and when the switch is turning off this channel charge is supposed to be ejected out of the MOSFET. So, when the switch turns off this channel charge gets ejected and if I assume that half of it gets injected in the uh, opposite directions uh, I have Q C H by 2 jumping on to this capacitor which is C S. Therefore, uh, the delta Q that I get on the C S that is going to be Q channel by 2 assuming that uh, the charge is injected equally on both sides after the MOSFET gets off because remember when you turn off the MOSFET the mobile electrons forming the channel charge have to be injected out. So, that the uh, MOSFET is turned off and that injection involves injection of negative charges on both sides because remember NMOS is going to have electrons as channels the mobile charges are negatively charged electrons and therefore, it amounts to a negative charge injection on both this point. So, this is basically going to be a negative Q C H minus sign injected onto the C S and therefore, uh, what we can expect is that as compared to the V in the V sample would be V in minus this mod Q C H upon 2. Now, this is the delta Q that is injected on the C S therefore, what should we expect for the delta V? So, we know that Q equal to C V. So, according to that we should have a delta V the change in voltage over here this delta Q C H or uh, Q C H divided by C S. So, this is going to be my um, the voltage. So, ideally it should have been just equal to V in, but because of the Q C H it is having uh, this particular magnitude and if I plug this in I have this as the positive quantity. So, W L C O X upon 2 C S times V D D minus V in minus V T n and if I take this common I am left with 1 plus W L C O X upon 2 C S and then I have some negative quantity which can be given as W L C O X upon 2 C S V D D minus V T n this is what we are left with. So, ideally I would expect V S equal to V in, but I am getting this whole term where I have first of all some non zero gain factor V in times this uh, gain factor which is greater than unity and then I have some offset term which looks like uh, independent of the signal. Uh, to the first order and definitely that that would mean that 
uh, I am having some corruption in the signal as compared to the sample signal, my data is uh, slightly different. And if I plot these, uh, so ideal curve would have been uh, V s equal to V in, but because of because of the uh, gain which is greater than unity, I am going to sub, I am going to get a, a slope which is greater than 45 degree and also we are going to have a negative uh, offset. So, when v in equal to 0, I should have some negative offset. So, as a result I am going to have uh, the actual curve looking like this ideally this, this is what we expect. And therefore, I have uh, deviation in the sample signal as compared to the input signal and uh, of course, we can see that uh, if the area of the switch is increased uh, that is w and l is increased and the cs is reduced then the effect of this channel injection the charge injection will be much more prominent so uh, if you are trying to increase your sampling speed then of course the corresponding charge injection effect can be more prominent it is going to corrupt your data more strongly so there is always a trade off between the sampling speed that we are trying to achieve and the charge uh, injected uh, remember that this is this charge injection phenomena is more or less going to be uh, independent of the T on duration, because T on duration or the duty cycle even if we aggressively scale it down, it does not affect the overall quantity of charge injected. Whenever it is getting off, it will inject the same amount of charge. So, it is independent of the T on of the duty cycle, the duty cycle is not going to affect it. Uh, however, the size of the MOSFET and the capacitor, they are going to affect it. So, if I am trying to make my T on uh, if I am trying to make the MOSFET larger or C s smaller in order to facilitate faster sampling. Um, it is going to have more corruption because of this uh, charge injection effect. And uh, uh, we can see that the overall uh, nonlinearity that is the overall gain error that is coming is dependent upon the W L C O X upon 2 C S. And if we talk about this quantity W L C O X uh, for a uh, overall if, if, if you are looking at a nominal device of 1 micrometer width uh, this parameter W L C O X for 1 18 nanometer technology L being minimum say 1 18 nanometer W being say uh, close to 1 micrometer this factor can lead to few femtofarads a uh, few tens of at the max you know few femtofarads and the CS um, if I want this to be uh, uh, this error to be sufficiently small CS must be uh, sufficiently larger than this. So, for example, if I am um, talking about say high precision say 1 percent or better precision then of course, I would like this to be at least uh, several hundreds of uh, femtofarad. Uh, the other term over here also can be problematic if I look at this V D D minus V T N this V T N is also a quantity which is not independent of the signal. So, V T N in general will depend upon the body effect and uh, if I look at the N MOS where the body terminal is uh, say grounded and you are having the source terminal which is equal to V in. So, ultimately this becomes a function of V in which is having a highly nonlinear characteristic. So, therefore, it is also going to introduce nonlinearity. When very high precision application that can be more critical for our application where the precision is relatively limited it is still uh, less uh, you know, not so much critical. However, we must make sure that uh, in the overall design when we are designing the sampling switches these effects are minimal and they are not violating our precision requirement. Uh, for for example, in our case, we would like to make sure that uh, um, the overall uh, the factor uh, resulting over here is not leading to more than say uh, a few millivolts of uh, error in the sampled data. Uh, if I talk about the other issue, which also comes in because of the clock uh, action, is called clock feed through, and that has to do with the parasitic the action of the parasitic capacitance is associated with the clock. So, if you have a n MOS over here and if I assume that you have the uh, parasitic capacitances from the gate to the source and gate to the drain in triode region remember both of these are almost similar and you are trying to switch this uh, switch on and off by applying that pulse and you are having the V in over here. Uh, ideally, if these two are absent and for the time being if I ignore the channel or the charge injection effect the switch is faithfully going to replicate the V in over here. But now, if I also look at the uh, condition when the switch is almost turning off under that condition I have an effective voltage divider formed between this C uh, I can call it C G D of this MOSFET and the C S. So, at the verge of turning off the switch is you can you can assume it is an almost an open circuit and then we have the input voltage over here transiting from V D D to ground. Therefore, we effectively have 
uh, capacitive divider where the input signal is transiting from VDD to 0 to turn off the switch and we have the C s over here. Uh, and as a result if I want to see what is the effect of this voltage transition on this point. So, this is something like an AC uh, divider uh, where because of the capacitive coupling this step voltage over here is going to have some effect over here. So, if I uh, look at this it is just going to be proportional to delta delta V is resulting from this uh, clock action is going to be proportional to C G D upon uh, C G D plus C S. And therefore, once again we can see that uh, if the MOSFET dimension is larger uh, for example, if you are having a larger W of this MOSFET once again the C G D will be proportional to the W of the MOSFET. Uh, also, you have in um, saturation region you have the overall uh, C G D uh, given uh, by a combination of the uh, oxide capacitance and the overlap capacitance. So, therefore, it is also proportional to the length of the MOSFET. So, in the triode region remember both C G S and C G D become almost similar and they are proportional to the uh, C G D is proportional to the 1 upon 2 C O x W L plus the C overlap. This term depends upon the W of the MOSFET and here of course, you have W L. So, both uh, dimensions. So, basically if you are having a larger size MOSFET once again to cater to the faster speed uh, you can expect more corruption and especially here you are having a BDD which is you know 2 volt and uh, you would not like this potential to fluctuate more than few millivolts because of this clock uh, action and therefore, it becomes uh, critical that this uh, C G D is sufficiently smaller than C S thousand times smaller than C S. So, once again uh, this is going to imp uh, impart some limit on the uh, some lower limit on the value of C S. If you want to have sufficient accuracy for the data sampling I would like this C G D to be uh, orders of magnitude thousand times smaller than C S and that would again imply that if I talk about the minimum size transistor also even if I am using minimum size transistor with W L minimum and it is having few femtofarads of parathetic capacitances that would imply that the C S must be at least few picofarad to ensure uh, that the signal is not significantly corrupted because of this delta V coming in. So, once again we can see that these constraints uh, related to the non realities of the switch are going to um, play a significant role in determining the sizing. So, uh, even if you are looking at low frequency application where the size of the MOSFET can be afford to be small we should uh, be careful about these effects and that is going to uh, put uh, uh, that is going to increase the um, lower limit for C s. So, first limit came uh, remember from the leakage uh, you are looking at the leakage and that should uh, not cause sufficient droop in the output sampled voltage as compared to the uh, ideal value. And there are other two components also coming in because of this uh, clock action term which is called which is termed as clock feed through and the other one charge injection. Why it is called clock feed through because the clock uh, it is transiting at this uh, gate of this MOSFET, but because of the parasitic capacitance you are having feed through of that uh, uh, voltage because of this capacitive coupling. So, if you connect to capacitors in series and you are having a uh, large jump at this point of course, you will see some fluctuation at this point because of this capacitive voltage division. Because remember this transition point is going to have high frequency component it is not so and uh, because of that high frequency component definitely uh, you are going to have the corresponding signal propagating at this point because of this voltage division. So, we have to be definitely careful about these two and uh, another uh, one, one important factor is that if you are using transmission gate uh, based MOSFET there uh, to some extent this both charge injection and flow feed through can be minimized because remember the PMOS and NMOS actions are just opposite when the NMOS is getting on PMOS uh, both the NMOS and PMOS are getting on the gate voltage of one of them is going to VDD another one is going to ground. Therefore, the polarity of the gate voltages or the clock waveforms are just opposite and to some extent they can uh, cancel um, the effect of clock feed through as well as charge injection. It depends very much upon the MOSFET parameters and it is very difficult to exactly match them and cancel them out, but to some extent of course, transmission gate can help in minimizing both these effects that is the clock feed through and charge injection because of the opposite polarity of the clocks applied to the gates of this MOSFETs. So, you can again look at the combined structure where you have the PMOS and the NMOS and you are having uh, the we are having the charge injection effect as well as the clock feed through over here and you have the sampling capacitor C s and you have the V in coming in from here. And remember uh, if I talk about the you know, clock action 
for turning off this MOSFET the clock will be going in the negative direction whereas turning off the PMOS it will be going in opposite direction. So, the uh, effect of clock feed through if I assume this equation is just opposite uh, on one terminal you are having the signal going from 0 to VDD another one VDD to ground. Therefore, to some extent it can get cancelled if these capacitances are you know, almost similar and in order to make this similar it will be important to make them almost uh, same dimension. Um, uh, how, however, you know it, it, it may not be able to exactly cancel that out. It is not always possible to have exact matching between these two, but to some extent it can definitely reduce. Likewise, if I talk about the uh, charge injection, charge injection for the NMOS as we said it is going to inject negative charges right. So, whenever it is turning off the electrons which are forming the channel of the NMOS will be injected on the positive side. PMOS is having holes in the channel right. So, uh, that effectively it means vacancy of electrons. So, when the PMOS turns off the holes get injected physically of course, electrons get injected into the PMOS channel to uh, kill the channel. As a result uh, uh, the NMOS is going to dump electrons whereas, PMOS is going to sink electrons when the channel gets off. Therefore, it will also try to cancel out this effect to some extent um, and uh, therefore, uh, once again you can have uh, some cancellation to some degree you can have some cancellation. Um, of course, if you look at the uh, charge stored the equation of the charge stored if you can see for the n mos it is going to be V g s. So, if I assume that uh, this particular potential is V in for the n mos we have seen the q channel of the n mos is going to be C o x w um, times L times uh, V g s minus V t. So, V g is uh, V d d minus uh, V s is V in minus V t n and the q channel for P mos if I look at this again L times C o x times W uh, for that it has to be V s g. So, uh, if I say uh, V s g so V s becomes V in and gate becomes 0 because when the P mos was on V g was 0. So, and V s was V in and then you have minus uh, mod V t p. So, this is the magnitude of the PMOS charge because for PMOS when the channel was on it was uh, the V s g s is the uh, input voltage or the caps sample voltage over here both of them being similar and the g is 0 for the on condition therefore, V s g becomes V in minus 0 minus mod V t p and uh, therefore, if you see the magnitude point of view it may not cancel exactly because you have two different terms over here only for certain value of V in it will cancel, but uh, at least to some extent roughly it can minimize the charge injection effect. Um, to some extent. Uh, <coughs> there are uh, other schemes people um, do apply like rather than uh, depending on this uh, NMOS and PMOS pair if you also add additional dummy transistors over here. For example, for the NMOS if you end up adding a dummy transistor this is a source and drain which are shorted together and then you are having the uh, W and then assume that this W uh, is half of the NMOS over here. So, this is if this is W 1 this is M 2. So, what I am doing is I am shorting the source and drain and this is the gate I am applying just the clock bar over here. So, when this turns on this turns uh, this turns off this turns on. So, basically when uh, if I assume that W by L 2 is uh, W by L 2 is half W by L 1 this is this dimension is just half the dimension of this one. That means, if I assume that half the channel charge is injected over here that can be used in forming channel of this NMOS also this is very well matched with this particular uh, NMOS. Likewise, if I put a PMOS dummy device that is having W which is just half the W of this PMOS when it turns off I will turn that one on. So, I, I, I can have another uh, PMOS device dummy I can short the source and drain. So, the source and drain is shorted and uh, if I am feeding clock here I will feed clock bar here if I am feeding clock bar here I will feed clock here. So, that uh, when this NMOS is turning off this dummy NMOS is turning on and it will just sink that charge because it if, if this is injecting the charge this channel is getting killed its channel is getting formed. So, it will just sink that charge likewise the PMOS over here when this is getting um, on uh, when this is getting off because of the 0 to VDD transition it is injecting the holes whereas, this is getting on because I am driving it by clock and as a result it will be injecting those holes to form its channel. So, when its channel is getting killed it is forming the channel likewise when its channel is getting killed this one is forming the channel and if their dimensions are matched as W by L of this being half of W by L of this one likewise W L of this being half the W by L of this one it can help in mitigating the um, 
um, charge injection to some extent provided we have almost uh, half charge injector on both side which is not always true. Also uh, we can see if this configuration can also help us in mitigating clock fit through because if I look at the uh, capacitance um, for one of these devices. So, the C G D of these devices will be the combination of C G S and C G D the total capacitance and the W of this one is half the W of the PMOS over here. This capacitance and the total capacitance provided by the parasitics over here will be similar. So, I am assuming that if this is uh, 3 and this is 4 W by L of 4 is half W by L of 3. Under that condition once again uh, these two capacitances combined together will be equal to the capacitance over here. And as a result uh, if I look at the condition I have clock transiting from 0 to high over here, but here you have just opposite transition you are applying the reverse clock over here. And as a result if I look at the total signal over here at this node I can model it as the uh, first capacitance having a transition from 0 to VDD and the second capacitance total capacitance provided by the MOSFET over here uh, which is having transition from VDD to ground and then I am having the total capacitance over here C S. So, these two will be almost similar because the W by L uh, of this one is half of this one. So, the C G D and C G S combined uh, for this MOSFET is going to be same as the C G uh, uh, D of this MOSFET assuming that in the triode region both are almost similar. So, in that case I can uh, uh, see that the overall effect of 0 to VDD transition and VDD to 0 transition will be almost cancel out because of the equivalent C G D appearing over here and then and the overall effect can be cancelled out likewise on the NMOS side. And because this NMOS these transistors are uh, the source and drain are anyway 0 say so in terms of static current they are not having any static current they are just going to sink the current little bit of a fraction of current when the channel gets on and again eject the current when channel gets off and their action is opposite to these two. So, they are not of course, having any static current. So, they will be having only transient current just to form the channel and the kill the channel. So, this methods can be used to mitigate the effect of clock fit through and charge injection to some extent especially when you go for high speed circuits where the switch dimensions becomes critical and the CS has to be smaller this becomes uh, very handy. We can see later that if you are looking using fully differential circuits uh, the effect of these uh, two phenomena can be mitigated further. So, here we are having single ended circuit if you are using fully differential circuit the effect can be f uh, mitigated to a larger extent. For example, if you have a uh, fully differential uh, implementation you are having two CS C S 1 and C S 2 and the input signal is also fully differential V in plus and V in minus. Uh, then these offset terms that come over here because of charge injection and clock fit through can be cancelled out to some extent. Of course, there is no linear dependency on V in just we saw that. Uh, so, it will not be ideally cancelling out fully, but uh, to some extent a fully differential implementation even for the comparator can help in, in killing this uh, non idealities. So, uh, that is one of the reasons why people prefer fully differential even fully differential comparators and fully differential ADCs. So, that the nodalities of these switches can be mitigated to some extent and uh, especially when you go for high precision circuit where the precision becomes a lot more critical uh, or you need to do some very sophisticated DSP in the digital domain for which you need very precise analog data. For that I would like to you know, cancel out these effects of these non-idealities, but in that case I would like to make even my ADCs of the comparator fully differential. Right now whatever comparator we are going to discuss probably is going to be first version is going to be single ended differential input, but single ended output, but later we can see how to extend it into a fully differential comparator which will be applicable for a uh, for the processing of a fully differential signal as well. Alright, so we can take a short break and then uh, start our discussion again.